Good morning, everyone. My name is Brian Jackson. I'm the CEO of Advocacy Technologies, as well as one of the members here at the MSS Advisors and CPAs. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you for uh, the time to join us this morning at this webinar entitled BMSS Presents Getting Started with Business Intelligence. Uh, BMSS was established in 1991 and has grown to become one of the top 100 accounting and advisory firms uh, in the U.S. We have over 300 employees across our family of companies, and we assist clients in a variety of industries, uh, including services in accounting, advisory, technology, payroll, PEO, and wealth management solutions in an effort to bring our clients peace of mind and provide exceptional client service. Abex Technologies is based here in Birmingham, Alabama. We specialize in offering custom customized cybersecurity, managed IT services, and business intelligence solutions uh, that can help companies unleash their full potential. Uh, with more than 20 years of industry experience, we've assisted uh, many businesses and organizations in navigating the ever-changing technology landscape. Uh, by doing so, we have enabled companies to overcome today's challenges while also guiding them toward a more promising and accessible tomorrow. Before we get started, there are a couple of housekeeping items I want to mention. Um, if you have any questions, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we will save questions till the end and try to go through as many as possible at that time. There will also be polling questions, so if you'd like to receive that valuable CPE credit, please answer those questions as they pop up. It was just a few weeks ago um, that I actually had the opportunity to attend the practice runs at the Indy 500 uh, in Indianapolis. And as uh, we were you know, looking at the screens as the cars were going around the track, it was, it was interesting to see just how many tweaks and changes and levers they could uh, use to affect how those cars went around the track. And uh, the driver can control almost any aspect uh, of the car's performance right there from the steering wheel. There's probably 30 different buttons that they can press and maneuver around. And you know, it wouldn't be possible for them to make those changes on the fly with all the without all the telemetry that's coming from that car back to race control. You know, and them looking at that data, analyzing it, and giving insights to the driver exactly what the car is doing in order to make up those just fractions of seconds on every lap to make sure that they not just compete, but also win. Now, our businesses aren't much different. We consume, we create, uh, we receive, and maybe even purchase data to help us make better decisions in our own companies. And how we use that data is going to decide at the end of the day whether we just compete or we actually win. So this morning, I'm excited to bring to you a topic which is uh, gaining a lot of traction, uh, definitely has a lot of interest from uh, many clients we talk to and many colleagues that I speak with, and that's on business intelligence. Specifically this morning is we're going to answer the question exactly how you get started with business intelligence. We're going to have a panel. We have a panel of guests with us today, and I'm very fortunate to uh, have the opportunity to introduce them. Uh, we have Isaiah Messer, Mark Waters, uh, Katie Garner with us this morning to talk about this important topic. Just a little bit background on our panelists. Um, Isaiah Messer is a business intelligence analyst here at Abacus. He's uh, based in Auburn, Alabama. Um, he's a certified public accountant and probably managers and works on the in-house data warehouse, but also oversees a wide range of projects. His responsibilities include assisting clients with software selection, implementing custom solutions, and developing database solutions. Additionally, Isaiah contributes to the risk advisory practice in our SOC audits, offering valuable security perspectives. He holds a degree in accounting and information systems from Auburn University and has previous experience in financial reporting and auditing. So welcome, Isaiah. Mark Waters is a professional EOS implementer with BMSS. Mark has or was a business owner and finance leader throughout his career. Um, recently, about 20 years ago, he and his group of investors purchased a distressed manufacturing company. Uh, they were able to turn that company around and grow revenue from $6 million to an astounding $31 million. The company utilized the EOS system to achieve their vision for growth and structure and bring the company success. Mark is very passionate about helping companies achieve success and believe EOS is the best system to help them reach their goals. And finally, our, special, our last special guest is Katie Garner, who's the Director of Business Intelligence at StateServe. There, she focuses on Power BI and brings data-driven solutions to the stakeholders. She's been at State Serve for about nine years. 
State Serve is a market leader in DME and pharmacy benefit management solutions, focusing on post-acute patient care. She has been working with data for more than 10 years and Power BI since 2018. She enjoys bringing solutions that give people back more of their time, and in her spare time, she likes attending to her cut flower garden and playing with her two small kids. So let's take this time to welcome our three special guests this morning. When I looked at our journey with data here at Abacus and also with DMSS uh, through our technology services, you know, one thing that drove us to implementing a better and improved BI technology solution was the adoption of EOS. Um, EOS has many components to make it work within an organization, but one of the most important components is data. So Mark's going to take a few minutes here uh, to talk about EOS, how data integrates with that, and how important it is. So I'm going to turn it over to Mark. Hey, Brian. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate that. Um, EOS, to me, um, is one of the best things that that enables a company to probably get past some of the problems they begin to feel uh, within a small business or really within any business. But as you grow, uh, what we've seen uh, with with most companies that we've worked with is that um, everything that has worked in the past uh, begins to uh, to not work anymore. So that's one of the problems. Uh, one of the other problems they face are uh, they get really frustrated with kind of losing control, uh, maybe not enough money, uh, maybe not enough time. But some of those, all those frustrations kind of lead them to having to juggle too many balls in the air. One, one of the things we have seen with EOS is, and I'm going to push this uh, slide up for you here in a second. Uh, but, but one of the things we have seen with EOS is we, we believe that EOS uh, is a holistic solution for helping you kind of harmonize all those moving parts in your business. And to the extent that you can strengthen uh, the, the six key components here of your business, we believe that uh, all of those problems, all of those balls begin to uh, find a place and you're able to solve those problems. And so um, as we talk about business intelligence and how EOS relates to that, um, as you work through these different, different uh, components within EOS, you're able to strengthen them and also be, begin to uh, take that information that you're probably flooded with and be able to use it and, and uh, apply it appropriately. So um, one of the things we, we want to talk about, I guess, today is how we talk about data and scorecards um, and also about how we, we structure the organization. Because as you grow, structure becomes really important. And so what that data does for you is help you, excuse me, uh, what that structure does for you is help you begin to to uh, understand where all of your people should be, getting the right people in the right seats to be able to handle the, the new and bigger organization. And as that information that you're beginning to gather for your business grows, you're able to structure that and be able to process that effectively. So um, I would say from, a, from an EOS standpoint, um, being able to handle everything that you're looking at today is going to be we're going to talk about focus on two things data and process and so that's those are the two areas we're going to focus on brian so i'm going to kick that back to you now thanks mark really appreciate that introduction to eos and just how important data and process are into uh using eos in your business i know it's very important to us um, as we have been using ES for a long time now, and uh, you know, having those leading indicators is important thing. So, so I'm going to ask that you know we're going to walk through a couple of questions for our panelists. So, um, and as I ask these questions, I'll uh, direct them to a panelist, and they will be able to provide their answer to them. So, uh, one of the first questions is is you know when you're getting started with the with business intelligence, you know why is it important of having goals in mind when you start dealing with and looking at data? So I'm going to ask Isaiah. Uh, to start out answering that question, and then we'll uh, go over to uh, Katie, and we'll wind, we'll uh, finish up with Mark. So Isaiah, absolutely, thank you, Brian. Goals are important because as organizations, we're gathering more and more data each and every day. Um, when you think about just a checkout at a restaurant, I mean they're asking for emails, phone numbers, uh, and sometimes your name. Uh, data is everywhere, and we're collecting so much of it. Um, we need to really hone in on what our actual goals are. 
Uh, and so when we talk about EOS, we really talk about three to five goals uh, that you're wanting to look at to drive your business. And that's the important thing. Um, you can focus on a lot of things in a lot of ways, um, but really focusing on those three to five things that's important for your business. And that's really going to help you get started with business intelligence because it helps you narrow your focus. It helps you hone in on something and actually be able to achieve goals and actually assign people to it. Um, so the goals are important because it gives you something to aim at. It gives you something to look forward to and build this data mindset around. So uh, to kick that back to Katie. Yeah, Katie, you've got a more practical experience with state serve. So when you started your business intelligence journey there, you know, what kind of goal, how did you guys approach, you know, determining what the goals were going to be? Maybe, you know, did you have an idea what the end looked like as you started? Yeah, so as we started, it kind of was a solution to be able to present to our clients as a benefit management um, you know, solution to be able to see where their spend was and what kind of equipment they were utilizing to better, um, better, you know, care for patients. So, um, yeah, so it kind of started out as that. So we had our initial KPIs that we kind of started with, um, and it just kind of grew from there, but I definitely agree with Isaiah. Um, you know, there's a, there's so much data, especially, you know, like healthcare, there's data in every field. There's so much data in healthcare. There's so many data points you can look at. And it just helps if you go ahead and define the KPIs that you're really going to use because there's so much noise and it just helps you create some actionable insights when you go ahead and you know, define those KPIs. Over to you, Mark. So when you, when you talk, with clients about implementing EOS and you get to that data component, you know, how do you tell them to approach that? I think from my standpoint or from our standpoint, we're talking with clients on the data side. We want to, them to understand uh, what are the five to 15 items that will really give them a pulse on their business, right? And so if they can determine what those uh, actionable items are, and, and by that, I mean, not results-based numbers, and so if they can look at uh, activity-based numbers that will help them determine, hey, this if these indicators are going in the right way, we know our business is going to end up with the right, right results. And so a lot of times people start off with uh, sort of results-based numbers, and they end up kind of looking at them from a standpoint of, okay, how did I get here? Why is, it, why is this messed up? And, and not looking at the activity. So they eventually that scorecard evolves to the point where they're looking at actual activity from a day-to-day -day standpoint, and they're able to judge that and know that and have confidence that those uh, results are going to be there. So Katie mentioned this, and, and Isaiah alluded to it too, too as well. I mean, we just have uh, the opportunity to access so much different data. We have sensors uh, that create data. We have systems that create uh, data as well. Um, what are some effective strategies to sort of work through that process and find the right data and make sure you're using that data? What are some strategies and best practices? Um, Katie, we'll start with you. And uh, what, what kind of things did you guys use to go through that data? Um, yeah, so like I said, we had our, our main KPIs and we kind of, um, honestly, so we use Power BI at our company. So really just playing around in Power BI, pulling data in, and using our initial KPIs to see what, you know, what other triggers were kind of related. So for instance, you know, we find that the more that our customers are using our software, the, you know, the lower their costs are. So we're able to kind of um, relay that to the client and, and be able to look into, you know, a few different things based on our initial KPIs. We can kind of dig in a little further and bring in some additional data points from there. Isaiah, what are you seeing with clients as far as helping them manage data and, and manage data and putting some effective strategies in place? I really like kind of something that Mark alluded to is the activity base, because I think what we've seen in the past, especially in the finance space, is looking at previous quarters and looking at revenue numbers and focusing on results. And I think it's important to take those goals and, and those type of things and actually look at the foundation of what's adding up to that. I mean, we see clients that focus on revenue, but 
they're missing out on good business because they don't have hours for their staff, right? Um, that's a problem in public accounting. We have, you know, uh, service lines that are taking up a lot of time, but they're not producing the right um, actual like accounts receivable to actually build up to the revenue that you want, right? So that you need to relieve hours on staff to actually get them on the projects that meet that revenue number, right? So when we get to the actual foundation of what's driving that revenue, um, we can actually build up to what we actually want, right? Is that revenue number growing to the next quarter? So I think it's focusing on the activity and seeing the building blocks that add up to that number so that we can actually make sure that on a day-to-day -day basis, when we're playing around with Power BI and we're seeing those numbers move each day, um, we're actually seeing what adds up to that. And then we can actually start changing things and tweaking things in our organization and seeing what data is there to manage that. Um, so I think it's important to look at the activity. You know, you, you said something there about foundations and building blocks. And to me, that screams processes. How important, Isaiah, are processes into getting good data? Uh, they're critical. Um, when we see the EOS model, we see data and process right there next together. And I think that's a very accurate representation um, because even within firms, we've seen um, just entering client information. Uh, many uh, ERP systems allow you to free form information. Um, so uh, the classic example is Alabama spelled 10 different ways, right? <laughs> we have uh, big A, big L, and then little A, little L. And then Alabama, unfortunately, probably spelled 10 different ways, right? Um, and then you put that in Power BI and, and you're like, why are all of my states odd? You know, um, you have quirky things like that when you're entering information, and especially a large organization. You know, when you have 100, 200, 300 people, um, there's going to be errors. There's going to be things that are that are off. And Power BI and Tableau are great tools to help you see that. Um, we see this all the time with clients. They have WIP that's not relieved, right? They don't have a process in place when that client uh, leaves. They don't relieve all that old WIP. And so when you start actually looking at numbers like that, you start seeing there's some processes that are wrong. There's some processes that are, are missing things. And so we have to go back to how is data getting into the system? How are we managing and updating it and deleting it when it's no longer useful? Uh, and so we have those processes that have clean data into the system. So we have those beautiful Power BI reports and that they're accurate. Um, that's an important thing. I mean, good data means good results. Bad data means what you're looking at may or may not be actually representative of what you're wanting. So Katie, how did processes figure into your journey uh, with state serving and, and getting a good BI solution in place and having those reliable KPIs. Yeah, so um, a lot of what I, Isaiah was saying, there's so much um, you know patient data that gets entered. So kind of locking down those fields within our system so we can do analysis on you know zip codes and um, you know patient demographics and that type of thing, and also equipment. So we you know. We've done some cleanup on our equipment mapping so that we're able to do some different analysis in that. But it is so important to do that on the front end because as you grow, you know, it just becomes a pain point to manage. And so if you set it up right on the front end, um, it's just going to help your business in the long term. And you're not going to go back a year from now after all this growth and be like, oh, we got to go clean all of this you know, this mess up because we set it up wrong. Um, so just setting those types of things up on the front end and, and documenting. So documenting your KPIs, documenting, you know, your measures and, um, you know, the steps that you use to clean the data. So even if you if you are getting clean data, um, you know, documenting what you're doing after the fact to help clean so that you can start using that data. And, you know, like you said, like clients come off, the clients come on, like who's inactive, what contracts do you need to, you know, take out of the data so that you're not making decisions off of stale information. Good. Mark, just a few minutes ago, you, you talked about activity-based versus results-based reporting. And, and can you talk a little bit more about that, sort of explain the difference between the two and how and then how that influences the development of a scorecard that you use with the OS clients? Yeah, Brian, and and as I mentioned, I'm going to throw because uh, Isaiah mentioned the model up here, too. I'm going to put that back up there to slide. 
But as we talked about with EOS, um, all six of these components really help you kind of harmonize all the moving parts of your business. And so as we walk through um, each of these each of these components, Brian, um, the first thing you do is kind of get everybody on the same page with where you're going with your vision, right? And, and understanding that we, we answer eight questions to help people kind of understand what they want from their business. And then we work to help strengthen their people component. But then when we get to the data component, a lot of times people have been making decisions based on gut feelings and emotions and just kind of a, a feel for the business for years. And so we ask them to begin to use data to make their decisions. And so what happens is you end up with a very transparent organization as you strengthen these first three components, right? When you get everybody understanding where you're headed, you're getting the right people, and then you're working, making the decisions based on data. As you strengthen those, um, everything that looks outside of those, those items that, that don't fit any longer begin to stick out. And so what we find with a lot of people is initially when they start with a scorecard, and I'm going to uh, show that slide. Let's, let me slide down to it here. Um, one second, sorry. I'll go pull that back up, excuse me. And then uh, show you here in a second. But um, but as we go down to a the, the slide for uh, the, the scorecard, I want to show that to you. <laughs> Sorry. I think one thing important that you said that I really liked was, you know, at some point you've got to get past just using intuition to run a company. Right. And is that is that something you see companies break through as they start going through the process of implementing EOS as far as they're concerned? Yeah, I think as we go through there, we we want them to develop uh, a feel for and, and an understanding of all right, what's driving those results, right? And so as we again, as we kind of harmonize all those moving parts, what we're what we find is that everybody, every single company starts off, and we did that in our company that we had. Uh, we start off with all these you know, results that we're looking for. So we we have to break down back into buckets. So let's just say you're talking about a number of sales revenue goals and you're saying, OK, I don't like the sales number I have. How do I get to the right answer? Well, you find out that, OK, I need to make a certain number of prospect calls. I need to do a certain number amount of research. I need to to make a number of proposals. I need to make a number of follow-up calls. Well, all of those become activity-based uh, activity based uh, actions that you can measure on a weekly basis. And so we ask you that as you walk through this process that you begin to take those items and make those your measurables and not the end result of the sales, right? And so that we ask you to then, you know, put a goal out there for each of those activity-based numbers. And so you also next assign somebody who's responsible for each one so that it's measurable and it's accountable at the same time. And then ultimately what we want you to do is to track 13 weeks at a glance, right? So that you can always have or be able to see trends develop, you know, if there's any problem, if you're going up, if you're going down, hey, there's, you know, two, you know, one time's an anomaly. You know, if you've got three weeks where you're missing a goal, all of a sudden you're saying, hey, maybe there's a problem here, right? And you can begin to see that. And if you can see that far enough out, if you know on that proposal, hey, if, if, if I do 20 proposals this, this week, I'm going to hit the right number of sales, you know, six weeks from now. Well, all of a sudden, if you've got bad proposals for three weeks in a row, you know that, hey, my sales number is going to be declining, in, you know, six weeks from now, five weeks from now. So I've got to do something to react to that. So I've always looked at that as a difference between like leading, leading indicators and lagging indicators. I mean, financial statements are lagging indicators. We, we get those 15, 20 days after the month ends, but would these be, you, you consider these activity-based, would that, that be the same as leading indicators? Exactly, yeah. It's almost like, um, a, you know, a regression analysis type thing where it can almost predict the future. Um, and that's the benefit of uh, Business BI because, you know, that's to me how you're able to take some of that information. Again, you, you're getting flooded with information uh, throughout your business. And using BI to me is being able to take that and be able to craft the right uh, leading indicators that are going to give you the right answer that you're going to be looking for. And so if you can figure out, like Isaiah was saying, that the right information to be looking at, 
then uh, the information coming from Business BI can put it in the right form for you, and you, you're able to, to achieve the results and also predict the results that you're you're, you're looking for. And and you know, looking at the technical side of this and the data, you know, what about the real life impact? So you know, I'm going to throw this back to Isaiah. You know, as you've worked with clients in a lot of projects with advocates, you know, give an example of how you know we've worked with a client. Hey, we've either modified a process or we found something and, you know, produced data that's led to a, a major impact, either growth or maybe solving a problem for them. Give us an example of what that looks like. Then I'll go over to Katie and ask her to give her an example of state serve as well. Absolutely. One of the ones that I can remember in recent time was with the municipality. Um, so it was, uh, they had fleet uh, vehicles, you know, they drove around I and mean, it was probably hundreds of vehicles for this, uh, this large government. And um, they noticed a lot of fuel expense. They were they were paying a lot of money in in fuel, and so our BI team was able to load all of their ERP data uh, from this, and we noticed a pattern. Um, and we were able to track it down, and we noticed the amount of vehicles and the amount of miles that they were driving, um, and the prices didn't add up. And so we started investigating that, and we figured out that the fuel cards were be, being used for premium fuel. Um, and I don't know how many of you drive an F-150 or an F-250. They don't require premium gas. Um, so they were able to put a policy in place on their cards where it only accepted, you know, the 87 gas that it was required to use. Um, and that saved them tons of money um, and ultimately cut back an unnecessary expense that they didn't even know they had. Um, and so when you start uncovering those layers of data, um, you can notice patterns and trends and be able to solve problems, whether it's you're trying to grow your business or you're trying to cut those unnecessary things that maybe slip through the cracks, especially as you grow. Katie, if you don't mind sharing some success stories um, in your experience at State Server or otherwise, uh, where business intelligence has impacted growth or solved a problem for you guys. Yeah, definitely. Um, one of the, you know, Oh, there's so many examples. Um, so one Give of me the, one or two then. <laughs> <laughs> let's see. Um, so we've we've got a few different um, reports that our our network team uses internally um, to help you know help with patient care. So we we do have some indicators that they're looking for on the you know different metrics on quality and ordering behaviors um, to be able to determine whether the providers in a certain market are having some services. Um, you know, and then they're able to go in from there and you know look at that market as a whole and look at the metrics that we measure in those markets to be able to determine, you know, was there growth in patients? Is the provider overloaded? Are, is the provider having issues? Are the hospices ordering practices, um, you know, affecting the provider's ability to care for patients? So there's a lot of different um, indicators, but we do have some reports, some great reports set up that um, our network team's able to look at it by market and be able to quickly go in and, you know, um, before it becomes a problem for patient care, you know, help help bring a solution to either the clients or, you know, our providers in, in that market. So that's one example. <laughs> so, Katie, do y'all using kind of automation to notify um, you know, hey, there's a problem here in email. Does it turn red on the dashboard? I mean, how 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 do you use the the dashboards and the business intelligence uh, work to actually notify you and let you know, hey, yeah, we've got a problem here? Yeah, so we've got some uh, maps. So all of our reports, they refresh daily. Um, they're re pulling information from multiple sources. So whether it be from our software on how many orders and what type of orders are being placed, um, what kind of equipment is out. Um, we have some quality reporting. So, you know, we have call centers that are calling to make sure the patients are getting, you know, they take a survey on the delivery of the equipment and that type of thing. So um, they're looking at those. All of that feeds into one Power BI report um, from several different data sources. 
Um, and then we've got some different maps. So we, we have some color coding on the maps, you know, red, yellow, green, um, those refresh daily. So if a market they're you know, they're pulling that report up daily, I don't know if they have any email notifications. That's definitely something that we're looking into right now, um, from Power BI, but they, uh, they're in there daily looking at it. So they're able to see like, Hey, this market went red. Um, and it wasn't previously. So we need to go in and then they have, you know, additional tabs in that report with more detail so they can really dig in on, you know, who it's affecting, who they need to reach out to, the phone numbers, you know, all of that information based on um, some of the color coding and the maps and the, the different graphs and things. And do you guys have this report distributed out to everybody or is it something you guys look at as a leadership team or is it published for something? What, how do you deliver this information to the end users to make that right decision? Yeah, so most of our uh, most of our Power BI reports are internal right now. Um, they use them when they're in calls, but we don't have uh, you know external access given to our clients right now. Um, so usually it's it's based on team. So we've started using the apps within Power BI because mm -hmm. we do have so many different types of reports. Um, there's, again, a lot of noise. And so having you know one report with all the information, but then having additional reports that you can put into an app so they can dig in and, you know, kind of look more into the details um, as they notice um, things that they, you know, need to look into. So um, <clears throat> right now, the that that specific report is, you know, for one team. So my my team at StateServe really supports the whole company, um, and we, um, you know, so we have different workspaces for for each of the teams really, and we'll distribute those reports to, you know, the appropriate teams. How important it is, Katie, for your team, but all the other teams to really look at data through the same lens where you have, hey, we have one consolidated reporting system and not what we probably see. I know a lot is we have, uh, you know, this team having their own report, this team having their own report. How important is it in your organization for everyone to look to the same lens when it comes to, comes to your data? Absolutely. That's that's how this department really was born, um, I think, in 2019, 2020, 2018, 2019, um, everyone had their own analysts. So each department kind of had an analyst on their team. And, you know, we were all looking at p different numbers, potentially. I mean, even financial metrics, they were looking at things differently. Um, so that's kind of how this department was born. Um, so one source of truth, you know, we have all of our um, data flow setup. That's how we we pull data into our Power BI reports through the Power BI data flows. And then all of the reports for the different departments are built off of those same data flows. So we're all pulling from the same source of truth um, and we're all looking at the same numbers and also, you know, the same the same measures. So, you know, those KPIs that I talked about, those are defined. The whole company looks at them you know, in a same, a same or similar manner. So having those documented and, you know, the, the network team may look at, you know, things differently because they're focused on providers versus, you know, our client services team who's focused on their clients. They may look at, you know, present things differently to the client, but they're based on the same um, data and the same metrics. So Perfect. Great answer. You know, looking at a client, you know, as we're going through this webinar and, uh, you know, I'm sure there's some attendees thinking like, you know, how do I get started with this? You know, they know they've got the data. They they know they want to, you know, increase their performance. Maybe they've reached a point where, hey, we use intuition up to this point to make business decisions. But as Mark says, hey, if we want to really grow, hey, data is where it's at. We have to use data to drive decisions. So uh, I'm going to start with Isaiah, you know, how can a company get started with, with business intelligence? What are sort of the, the starting points they need to think about, maybe the steps they need to consider um, as they begin on this journey? Absolutely. I think taking an inventory of the data that you do have, I think is important. Um, and then once you kind of have an idea of what you have, building that roadmap. And I think that's kind of where the EOS model goes into the vision, right? Um, building from that data and those processes into what you actually want as an outcome, right? 
So if we know what data we have, we know what processes feed that data, um, then we can begin to look at tools to wrangle that data, be able to report off of it, um, and be able to actually drive insights. You know, we often talk about information into knowledge, knowledge into action. Um, and so we have to understand what we have and then what we can use it for and then actually what our goals are. Katie, same question to you. I mean, you, you guys got started back on this journey with State Server a while back. You know, what did that look like? You know, what kind of buy-in did you need from leadership? What kind of tools did you guys consider? Talk, give me some detail about that journey for you guys. <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. Um, so really important to have the C-suite buy-in. So initially our CEO came to us and wanted to, you know, he got shown a Power BI report and got really excited about it because it's flashy and he could <laughs> show it to a client on a call and, you know, pull it up on his iPad and, and you know, filter the regions and all that stuff and lots of graphs and maps and things. Um, so that's really, you know, they said, hey, can you put a Power BI report together? So that's really how it started. Um, and I think that's, you know, I'm really passionate about Power BI. I love it. If You know, there's other tools out there for sure. But, um, you know, just giving someone a project like that and seeing who gets excited about it, who wants to, you know, take a, you know, a Udemy course or take, mm -hmm. take an online course um, just go a little bit, you know, above and beyond to, to learn how to use it. Cause it, it is a huge time saver on, you know, just internal processes as well. Um, but yeah, definitely C-suite buy-in is really important and really helps with adoption across the company because you, you can build these reports, but you want other people to look at them. So having that C-suite buy-in really helps with that. And it also helps you on the, you know, the data side. They can really um, go to bat for you if you, you need the enhancements in your data infrastructure um, and those types of things. So I think that's absolutely important. There's definitely some... Um, um, I think initially we hired a consultant to do a couple mm -hmm. of projects as well. And then, you know, once the initial couple of people really took interest in learning how to use the software, you know, our company did invest in us and send us to um, a three day in day in person training. Um, and so that was so helpful that, you know, you can take some courses and get your feet wet, but really immersive in-depth you know full day trainings i would highly recommend um just blocking out you know work for the day and really focusing on on learning so so one one follow up there you know as you guys hey we we saw what the you know hey what we can do with our data we saw what the the dashboard provided at power bi you know how important would you, i mean was it for you guys to really start small and have a controlled scalability of the Power BI reports? Because in my experience, it's like once you you give one report out, it's like, hey, the door's just wide open and everybody wants access to this. So how did you guys work through that and sort of, you know, have more of a controlled scale versus like, hey, everybody's all, you know, everything exploding at one time? I think we're still dealing with that. <laughs> um, yeah, it, everyone sees the report and they're like, oh, I want one. And, um, you know, there's data everywhere, not just, you know, with our patients, internal, you know, like you guys are saying with your scorecards, each team has, you know, different metrics that they measure. And so everybody, you know, wants something. So I think just prioritizing things and help having, um you know, C-suite or, you know, higher ups help prioritize those, um, but also chipping away at it. I mean, we we do a lot of different things. So anywhere from HR and finance to, um, you know, ordering behaviors and that type of thing. So so I think that's why our team has just grown. And but the great thing about it is we're able to you know, save some of these teams a lot of time. Um, so if you're doing something the same way, the, you know, the same steps over and over again to update a monthly report, there's probably some automation that you can apply to it that you can save time. So 
I'm, I'm just really passionate about that. So I do um, tend to say yes a lot because I like to save people time. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, there's absolutely time save and, you know, you see that process improvement. So we are definitely measuring some of those things, some of those reports that we've implemented that are saving the different teams time. So you can, you know, and I think now our team is um, six people, six or seven people across. So, you know, We've grown, we've grown slowly, but, you know, you can just save so much, so much time for people and provide so much, um, you know, good information that they really see the value in it. So. Thank you. And, and Mark, you know, I'm a, I'm a company just started EOS, you know, I've got my vision, you know, I'm working on my processes, but I don't have a scorecard. How would you recommend they get started developing their scorecard you know, if they're, you know, a smaller business, maybe they don't have a technical staff, but what do you recommend to them uh, when it comes to EOS implementation in the scorecard? Yeah, Brian, I think a lot of it's going to relate back to the processes. Like, as I mentioned earlier, when, when you're talking about EOS, you've got your uh, data right next to the section on the, on the model uh, that is right next to process, right? And so process drives, ultimately drives everything in your business. And so, as you uh, determine that, hey, I've got six to eight to 10 possibly key core processes within my business, and I can be able to you know, understand what those are. And we tell people to simplify those processes, document those processes and train those processes. As you simplify those and train those and get those written out for everybody, each one of those processes lends itself back to creating a scorecard, right? Because you're able to say, hey, I've got 12 steps in this process, or I've got 10 steps, whatever that looks like. And you're able to relate that back, especially at, at maybe a departmental level, uh, but especially at, at the leadership level where they can look and see, hey, we've got some problems here on our scorecard. What's causing that? And if you can dive down and see it related to an actual step in that process, you're going to be able to uh, be able to fix that quickly, right? You can, you can either retrain somebody or you can determine, hey, something's going wrong in the, in the market. We've got to be able to address that. So a lot of times um, when you're talking about Power BI, you're talking about business intelligence, all of that information coming at you and maybe you've got a lot and maybe Power BI does, like Katie's talking about, looks a lot of fun and great. A lot of it gets back to, hey, how do I design a report that helps me address that problem uh -huh. that I'm looking for and looking to solve. And I've got a, I've got a bad, either bad information or I've got a problem here that I'm not getting the result I want. Let's dive back down into that process. Let's figure out what the steps should be if they're wrong, or let's figure out how to address them. And Power BI a lot of times can hone in on what that looks like. You know, one thing that was, was mentioned was, you know, saving time you know, having some, having a business intelligence initiative, you know, saving some time, uh, you know, Isaiah, how have you seen, you know, putting these kinds of uh, processes and data in place? How does it save time? And I'm more going back to, I'm sure we have people out there with using spreadsheets and databases and I'm sure access databases and crystal reports. How can, you know, a good business intelligence initiative help save time? Absolutely. Kind of back to what Katie said, if you have somebody that's very interested in it, um, they can find a lot of tasks to automate. Um, in uh, Microsoft Excel, you have something called Power Query. Um, and part of its ability is, is to take tasks that you do repetitive each and every time, and it can load that and build that in where it does that automatically on the same spreadsheet each month. Um, so that's just a very simple one. But I mean, of course, there's all the way to technical solutions where you use code and and automate tasks. And we've done that within our organization and we've done that for clients. Um, and so anytime you see repetitive actions um, in a process that are repeatable, that's often time somewhere that you can save time. And especially if you multiply that across teams, that's where you start compounding hours. And that's where you can really start saving a lot of time. If you're talking about a 10, 20, 30 person team, especially in a crunch time, you can really have a big impact by cutting out those repetitive tasks. Yeah, I think we can all agree it's better to have our team solving those problems than going through an Excel report and massaging the data to get to, hey, what do we need to do? I think we can all agree that's a better use of their time. You know, one thing that, uh, you know, we've talked about is, you know, I, I've rarely seen a company has, you know, one system that has all the data in it. 
And we know that's a problem. Um, we also know it can be solved. Isaiah, I know you've worked specifically in those type of projects. Tell me about how, you know, we've been able to or, or how you've seen solutions come into play to help, you know, consolidate data. Absolutely. I mean, with even within our own uh, product, Magnify, that's part of the goal, right, is to bring different data, whether it's for people, whether it's for financial systems, is to bring that data in and bring it together so that you can create some interesting insights, right? Um, if you're looking at hours and people and you can combine that with metrics, you can help see how productive they are, right? And that's a powerful metric. Um, and so when you are able to bring those different sources together, um, it actually helps kind of create some interesting things. And if you have people that are champions that want to go look at um, data and are interested in data, um, they get to have a lot of fun. Um, and so it's a challenge to bring different data together because there's all types of different factors. Um, they're going to different systems are going to process data different. They're going to store data differently. Um, so there's going to be a lot of challenges. But when you bring that together, um, and there's lots of solutions out there for that, um, depending on the industry that you're in, depending on the types of systems that you're bringing in. Uh, cloud systems oftentimes have integrations that are built in. If you have technical staff that can uh, integrate them, um, there's oftentimes APIs that can move data back and forth between systems. Um, and that gets into a little bit of the technical, but there's a lot of valuable insights in that if you're able to achieve that. So something like that's a challenge that can be overcome. So if I'm using, you know, one accounting system, I've got an operational system, I've got a CRM system, you know, you know, there's often conduits that allow us to consolidate that data into a common database um, to provide these type of insights that we're talking about. So. Absolutely. And, and oftentimes that's maybe a, a professional if you don't have the technical staff, especially if you are a smaller company or maybe you're younger in your data journey. That's maybe oftentimes a better time for a consultant like Katie was mentioning to get you started or come alongside as a partner. Um, oftentimes we see that's maybe a better solution than hiring a large team, um, which you may have to do, especially the more technical the solutions are. Katie, how important was you got was it for you guys to actually have uh, a third party come in or a consultant come in to to assist your team in getting started? Was that a, how important was that to you guys? Um, I, I think it was really important. Um, it definitely helped, you know, th they tackled a few big projects and, and that really helped and also helped get some buy-in. Um, our C-suite obviously, uh, or our CEO fell in love with it. Um, so that was easy, but, um, actually, you know, bringing some solutions, uh, quickly. So, you know, because you may not have somebody who's trained or, you know, is earlier in their data journey, like Isaiah was saying, um, so bringing someone in, it will help you set things up right um, so that you can, you know, be a, they can be a partner with you. And, you know, if you help you find somebody that, you know, could be a full time role um, and then, you know, work from there to create some some valuable reports for you and set them up correctly on on the front. Um, yeah. Yeah, you know, I think one. We talk a lot about Power BI, and I know there's some other tools out there. I know Tableau is one. You know, what are some other ones maybe, I guess, from a presentation layer, uh, you know, that maybe you've had some experience with besides Power BI that some uh, some of our um, attendees could take a look at? Um, yeah, so I, I haven't used a ton. I know Tableau. So we're working with uh, another, uh, like a pharmacy benefit management, and I know they use Google Looker. Um, we will be bringing all their reports over to Power BI, but um, some of them require you know, you to understand different coding languages, so SQL and that type of thing. Um, Isaiah may be able to speak more to that, but um, uh, we found that Power BI is very friendly for Excel users. So like you saying, Power Pivot, Power Query, those are things that are the backbone of Excel. So if you can take a Power BI course and, you know, yes, Power BI has the great graphics and all of that, um, that backbone is in Excel as well. So you can take those solutions and apply them to an Excel report and you don't have to, you know, share a Power BI report in the service. Um, you can implement those solutions and, you know, DAX measures and the data model within Excel um, you know, included in, in the, you know, Microsoft package. So 
Um, that's been um, really helpful for us because we, you know, do have a lot of Excel users. So mm -hmm. um, it's you know, trans, you know, translatable, you know, easy to pick up. It's easier to pick up than, you know, a coder, I guess. Isaiah, what, what are your thoughts? Have you got any experience with other uh, platforms besides Power BI that you like to share with us? Absolutely. There's a couple of different solutions out there, and I don't like to focus too much on the tool. Um, I think it's more about the process and the data side of it. But to Katie's point, if you're an Excel user, uh, Power BI is going to look very familiar. Um, DAX is the, the language that you're going to have to learn to build calculations in Power BI. To me, in my experience, that was a little bit different. Um, but Excel and Power BI go hand in hand. And oftentimes, uh, users that prefer Excel can take a Power BI report and download it as an Excel version if they're more comfortable with that. And so there is very much a tight relationship there. I also have experience with Tableau. Um, Tableau integrates with some other solutions. I believe they're owned by Salesforce. Um, so they have some integrations on that side. If you're in Google Workspace, Looker Pro is their um, Power BI type solution. Um, it integrates well with like Google Analytics. If you were like a marketing firm that used uh, that as your um, uh, mail provider, um, there's also Click. I know some uh, companies have used that as a third party solution and has some um, integrations. I believe they have other products that it integrates with. And so depending on what your ecosystem is of tools, you may be more comfortable with one versus the other. Um, if you're in the Microsoft suite, uh, Power BI is an easy recommendation. Um, it's same with Google Workspace. They're, they're built in solutions. They're often uh, much more economical than going out and getting another product. Um, and like Katie said, they're just so similar to learn. If you've done Access, if you've done Excel, if you're used to that ecosystem, it is a natural fit. Yeah. Well, um, I don't see that we have any more questions uh, that have come in uh, from the audience. So I just want to thank all of you for participating in the, in the webinar this morning. And uh, just a huge thank to you for taking time to speak with us today. Isaiah, Mark, Katie, thank you very much. Um, if you're currently an advocate or BMSS client, we appreciate your trust in us. If you're not, we'd love to have you an opportunity to speak with you. So uh, please uh, visit our website at uh, advocatestechnologies.com or bmss.com uh, to reach us. Um, just a quick reminder, CPE certificates will be issued approximately two weeks uh, following today's webinar. Uh, we have recorded this webinar and it will be made available at bmss.com. Uh, under the news and events by the end of the day. So thank you all uh, speakers. Thank you all attendees for your time this morning. Hope this information is valuable and I hope uh, maybe we'll talk to you about your BI journey very soon. So thank you very much. Appreciate your time. Have a great day.